Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. All right, you're sort of awake. I know you're coming from work and from a long day, so we will keep, this will be an interactive service to keep you awake and, uh, and attentive, so that will be wonderful. But thank you for joining us on this Good Friday service at KMCC. Uh, I'm really glad you came for this special time together, and I hope this is an encouraging uh, evening for you. Um, by the way, we don't have child care tonight. If your child becomes disruptive or wants to have a little bit of movement, uh, the, rooms are, or the room over here is open for that, and you can feel free to take them over there. Uh, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Father, just thank you so much that we can come here together tonight on this Good Friday. Uh, it's, it's good in the fact that you died for us and we received so much. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's sobering to think of what you had to go through to save us. And so we want to take a moment and remember uh, what you've done for us and proclaim your death until you come. And so that's why we're here tonight, to, to bring praise and honor and glory to you and to say thank you and to remember what you have done. And so I pray that you would be with us in this service and God that what uh, we say and do would be pleasing to you. And I pray that we would uh, leave here a little bit differently than when we came. And so we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Uh, you have heard the story countless times, uh, Jesus crucified upon a cross. You came here this evening uh, if expecting to hear about it, and you will. Uh, we need to hear the old, old story again and again and again because the message of the cross is the focal point of God's communication with us. And without wanting to sound too dramatic, that means that everything in life, everything in life hinges upon the cross. I'm going to take us back a little bit. Um, crucifixion uh, was invented around 300 B.C. by the Persians, likely. Uh, the, it was a torturous practice of execution that was passed on to the Romans. They didn't uh, figure it out, but they perfected uh, the procedure. By the time Jesus was crucified, thousands upon thousands of criminals and slaves and conquered peoples had been crucified. So the Romans knew what they were doing. And the whole process of crucifixion was a, a mockery. It was meant to uh, inflict the most pain possible upon the individual. It began with a flogging that could have potentially killed in and of itself. In Matthew 27, 26, and we're going to be in Matthew 27 uh, tonight, it says that they whipped Jesus uh, before they even took him towards the, the cross. And the whip was made of multiple lashes uh, containing pieces of bone and metal. It literally ripped the backs off of the victims. As the prophet Isaiah said, Jesus was marred and disfigured beyond recognition. His flesh torn and his, his body exposing tissue, muscle, and, and, and bone. It was a horrible thing to go through. It, and if that wasn't enough, we're going to read together what happened next. So we're going to have a responsive reading now. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put the scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail! King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Now a battalion would number about 600 men, which seems excessive to me for one man, right? It's like a mobbing. It's like a lynching, if you think about it. He's already been whipped within an inch of his life, and then they humiliatingly strip him of his clothes, and he stood in front of 600 men naked. And then they mockingly put a red robe on him, and they twist together a, a crown of thorns, and they smash that crown of thorns on his head, and the huge spikes start penetrating his scalp and his skin, and, and then they kneel before him and they mock him. And they spit on him. And they took the reed out of his hand and they smacked him on the head with it, driving those spikes further and further into his head. And when they were all done, then they stripped that red robe off of him. And again, he's naked and bloody and soiled and bruised and broken and torn. And that was Jesus standing there. 
And this was commonplace for the Romans. They were barbaric. They, they tortured and, uh, people to death. And traditionally after this, the condemned individual was forced to carry their cross to the place of execution where then they were nailed to that cross, arms outstretched and, and knees bent as if the person were sitting on the pole. You see, as I said, crucifixion is a mockery. It's like a mock throne. Like a king on a throne, the individual was lifted up for all to see and he's sitting and with his arms outstretched as if receiving glory and honor. But yet the crowds were encouraged to watch them in this, in their agony, and mock them in their pain and in their suffering. So the dying individual was simultaneously tortured and shamed. And they were typically crucified naked, and so they suffered the stealing of all of their dignity. It's a horrible, horrible way to die. And this is how God, God, (laughs) in the person of Jesus, chose to suffer and die for you and for me by horrible execution. Let's read what happened next. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. So they led Jesus out to crucify him. But Jesus had lost so much blood and had been whipped so badly that he had endured so many countless beatings to his head, he could not carry his cross. And so the soldiers compelled Simon to carry it for him, and they, they go off to Golgotha. It's a piece of ground known as the skull. It's the universal symbol of death. And it was most likely the place that the Romans uh, did numerous executions. It was among a, along a main thoroughfare uh, so that all who came by could see him. And then there's uh, this thing about wine and gall. This is more than likely a narcotic and that was given to those suffering the agonies of crucifixion to lessen the pain a little bit. But Jesus refused to deaden uh, the pain or to lessen his consciousness in, in his final act of obedience. Jesus was fully aware, fully conscious, fully accepting the totality of the pain and agony, the heartache, and the shame. And he did this for the sake of all of us who would believe afterwards, for you and for me. And it's an example to me. This was an interesting thing that I thought of. Did, did G, that Jesus did not take the easy road. He did not seek to lessen his pain. He did not seek an escape from his fate. He did not use chemicals to help him endure. He relied fully upon the strength given to him by the Spirit of God to accomplish the will of God. He relied fully on the Holy Spirit, not on anything else. And and for some of us hearing that story, how may the act of Jesus refusing chemicals be an example for us? And then when they crucified Jesus, they took off the cloak that they had put on him before they started the journey to the execution site. And so they removed his garments, plural, inner and outer, which means that Jesus again is naked out on that road. And they afforded Jesus absolutely no dignity. They shamed the God of the universe. And the soldiers would typically split the belongings of the executed, and all Jesus had, though, were his garments. And so in order to determine who got them, then they cast lots in order to see who would receive those. And then it says that they crucified him. And Matthew records this so that we would all know, make no mistake, Jesus was crucified on a cross for all to see. It was not some made-up story. It was not an embellished story. This was actually what happened. And it says they sat down to watch. How horrible is that? Would you sit down to watch someone in agony dying upon a cross? Just amazes me. Let's continue reading Matthew 27. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, weighing their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, 
come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, and let God deliver him now, if he desires it. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So there's one on his right and one on his left. And there's terrible irony in this statement. A few days before, James and John, two of the disciples, uh, had approached Jesus and they had asked, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left when you get into glory. When you become king, we want to be right there next to you. And Jesus had responded with a statement that was kind of confusing. He said, you don't know what you are asking. Jesus, knowing what his glory would entail, finished his response with, but it is for those for whom it's been prepared. Ironically, Jesus, in his mock glory, was flanked by two robbers. Jesus did have one on his right and one on his left hand for whom it had been prepared as he was mockingly hailed as the king of the Jews. And it wasn't just the physical agony that Jesus suffered, but the stripping of all his dignity, the relentless mockery, the outright rejection and disdain. And and Matthew names three groups that we just read of that that mocked Jesus to his face. There were the passers-by. It says the passers-by derided him. And the word deride means to blaspheme. So they wagged their heads and they were just like, ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down off that cross. The crowds hailed Jesus uh, just a few days before as he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey and now they're blaspheming him to his face. And ironically, they were quoting Jesus who predicted this very moment, how they would destroy his temple, the body, right, his body, and that that he would rise again in three days, thus rebuilding it. So they knew his words, but they were blasphemously throwing those words back in his face. And then there was the chief priests and the scribes and and the elders. They were mocking him, it says. And and they said, he saved others. He can't even save himself. And these were Jesus' arch enemies all through his uh, three years of ministry. And and now they're arrogantly standing there uh, looking at him in agony as though they're victorious, right? They, They think that they've silenced Jesus and proven once and for all that he's a fraud. And here's the real irony in their statement is, he is the king of Israel, Well, let him come down off that cross, and then we will believe him. So they're saying that they would convert if he came down off the cross. And all the while, in order for them to truly receive salvation that he had to offer them, he had to stay on that cross. And they said, he trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Again, they're using his own words against him. And mockingly, the scribes are looking right at Jesus, right? God in human form, a living parable of love and forgiveness, silently enduring all of their evil mockery and shame and abuse, all for the sake of his love for them and and for us. And then, if it couldn't get any worse than that, there's a third group, the the robbers. So so those who were crucified with him, it says they also reviled him. And and the net translation records it this way, and I think the, the wording's a little bit better there. It says, the robbers who were crucified with Jesus spoke abusively to him. That carries some meaning in today's culture. So they, they, they were verbally abusing him. So these guys, these criminals, these, these robbers, these murderers, and you know what that type of a, a person, what kind of a, a language they bring to uh, the forefront, right? So they were shaming Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, was associated with the lowest of the low, the one on his right and one on his left. One commentator wrote, In the death of Jesus of Nazareth, God identified himself with the extreme human wretchedness. Jesus was mocked by the worst of society, the criminals sentenced to death, and he silently allowed it to happen. Solomon wrote that there is a time to speak and there's a time to refrain from speaking. Jesus said nothing at this moment, but his words that were spoken weeks before I think we're echoing in the air above this scene. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And thousands of years later, 
this world really hasn't changed. The mockery still happens today. Those who reject Jesus and who are inconsiderate of life, and uh, they shame and they defame and they taunt those who are righteous in Jesus because they believe. Sometimes even they kill uh, followers of Jesus. All around the planet we hear about martyrs even today. They speak abusively. They scold followers of Jesus for believing in a merciful and loving God. They mock on social media and mainstream media. They don't agree with who Jesus is, and so they lash out at those who do. Now, what did Jesus do? Did he lash back? Did he argue? Did he try to persuade? He remained silent. As Isaiah said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Perhaps there's an application in here for us to consider as we may get mocked or reviled or on social media or at school or at the job site. What would happen if we stayed silent? What if we silently prayed for those who persecute us? Like Jesus did, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And that's the power of the cross. Let's, let's stand and sing this song. Let's continue reading from Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Thanks for your patience with our technical difficulties. <clears throat> so it talks about darkness. This was not an eclipse. It was not some natural phenomena that scholars or scientists will tell you about in order to explain this time away. This was a supernatural darkness that covered the whole land. Thousands of years earlier, the prophet Amos, talking of God's judgment, said this in Amos chapter 8, verse 9, On that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. So all of history, all the forces of evil, all the sin of the world, all the evil of every heart and every corner of every crevice of the world converged upon the broken body of Jesus hanging upon the cross and God's judgment came down upon him. And he was shrouded in darkness alone for three long hours. Breath after breath, agonizing breath, pushing up on his bruised and bloodied legs, hanging by his arms and tendons because his shoulders were probably out of their sockets, saddened and grieved by the rejection. He was humiliated and shamed by the mockery. His head was pounding. For three dark hours, Jesus succumbed to the evil, violence, abuse, hatred of the world, and the judgment of God. That should have been on us. And then his last words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the moment that Jesus dreaded most, separation from God, the Father, the eternal Trinitarian bond of perfect love and unity and harmony had been disrupted. And in an agony of spirit, Jesus, the suffering righteous servant, took upon himself the separation from God that all of us evil people rightly deserved. And Jesus himself asked the question that we all ask. When the circumstances in our lives seem to spin out of control, when our problems snowball getting bigger and bigger to the point where we don't see a way out or how to dig ourselves out, when friends and family turn and leave us, when evil rulers tighten their grip and make it difficult to live, when friends and loved ones uh, pass away unexpectedly, when those who hate us mock and abuse us and mistreat us, and it feels like God is nowhere to be found, it's a question that comes to mind. Why? Why does it have to be this way? O oh Lord, Psalm 88, the psalmist says, why do you hide your face from me? Why have you made me your target, Job said. 
Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble, David said. Why do you hold back your right hand, the psalmist said. Why do you idly look at wrong, Habakkuk said. Why have you forsaken me, is what Jesus said. It's not wrong to ask why. In fact, in doing so, we join countless of saints down through the centuries. We join Jesus himself in seeking the face of God. God, why are you doing this? And we'll come back to this in a few minutes. And then there was sour wine and this weird thing about Elijah. Jesus yelled, Eli, Eli, not lama sabachthani. Eli in, in, in Aramaic sounds a little bit like the word for or the name Elijah. The Old Testament tells us that Elijah didn't die, but he was taken up in a, in a whirlwind to heaven. And it, it was believed, there was a legend during Jesus' time, that Elijah would come and be a part of the Messiah's deliverance of Israel. And they thought that maybe Jesus was calling out to Elijah, right, in desperation. Elijah, come and, and save us. And giving him sour wine may have been a further mockery, an attempt to help Jesus to hold out a little longer in agony, as they mockingly said, wait, let's see if Elijah does come and take him down. And then Jesus uttered his, a loud cry and he yielded up his spirit in verse 50. So, so Luke records Jesus' final words as, Father, into your hands I commit your spirit. Luke records Jesus' final cry as, it is finished. And here's how I picture it. Jesus is in agony and sorrow and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he took a little sour wine which gave him a little moisture on his mouth to say a few more words. And he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then his final words on the cross were words of victory. Jesus uttered a loud cry and he yells out in victory, it is finished. And he yielded up his spirit. Jesus' final words on the cross were words of victory. They, they were not words of resignation or of defeat. Jesus uttered a loud cry and he yells, it is finished from the cross. The suffering was complete. The effects of the fall were reversed. The consequences of sin were destroyed. Death was defeated. And soon Jesus would sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And it says that he yielded up his spirit. Now, I want you to notice who the actor is in that statement. It's Jesus. Jesus set aside his spirit. He yielded it up. Jesus was not overcome by death. Jesus, death did not take Jesus. The Sanhedrin didn't murder him. The Romans didn't take his life. Jesus willingly gave it up. At just the right time, knowing that he had accomplished what was necessary to offer forgiveness to all of mankind, having paid the price for the ransom of all who would believe, he yelled out in triumph, it is finished. And then he himself yielded up his spirit and entered the valley of death for us. He was sovereignly in control even of his own death. Let's stand and sing this song and hopefully it'll be on the screen. Amen. All right, let's continue this with this next passage. You can be seated. All right, read with me. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. This is quite a stunning aftermath. Um, I want you to picture this, if you will. Jesus has been hanging on the cross for more than three hours now, and there's, there was darkness from noon until three. And then it's, so it's noon, it's, it's noon. And instead of glaring midday sun, hot, whatever, there's this incredible darkness and an eerie nighttime in the middle of day. It's unimaginable, it's unexplainable, it's supernatural. And the darkness of sin covered the land for three hours as Jesus was there. And then this fear invoking darkness. But at Jesus' death, at that precise moment, the sun came out. The darkness was dispelled. The powers of death and darkness were destroyed. The temple, the, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to the bottom. And this is hugely significant. I'm not going to go into it, but it signifies that the way to God, 
His presence has been opened to anyone who would believe that Jesus was the Savior of the world. And it says that the earth shook and trembled. The rocks split in two as God's creation witnessed his own death. The very earth itself trembled at the significance of this moment. The tombs were opened and, and the bodies of the saints were raised. It says, I don't, I don't know exactly what happened here, but God did some miraculous thing that accompanied the death of Jesus, unexplainable things. And I think it's a foreshadow of things to come. When Jesus would rise from the dead and even further in the future than when we get to look forward to being raised from the dead when Jesus comes back for us again. And the light then splits the darkness, revealing that the way, the truth, and the life was hanging on a cross dead. And now the centurion guard has been standing there in the dark for three hours, and he heard Jesus cry out, in victory, it is finished. And he heard Jesus' breath go out of his body, and as that happens, the sun comes out. And simultaneously, there's an earthquake, and the rocks are splitting, and there's people rising from the dead, and there's a temple curtain is torn in two, and the centurion saw what took place, all of this. And he's standing there and he's facing Jesus. He's watching what happens. And, and this centurion has seen dozens, if not hundreds, of crucifixions. He's used to death. It's no longer traumatizing to him to see an individual breathe his last. It was part of his job. And he's standing there and he's facing Jesus, watching him in agony, pain, simply waiting for Jesus to die like any other criminal he's ever watched. But this one's different. He saw what took place the earthquake. He saw how Jesus died, his loud cry. And here's the deal. The, cent the Gentile centurion heard and saw the way in which Jesus died. His death was somehow different than all the other deaths that he had witnessed in the past. The darkness, the earthquake, the veil, the sunlight, it all came together in the, as a suffering servant who was condemned as the king of the Jews voluntarily gives up his life to death. Death did not overwhelm Jesus. Like all the other men that this centurion had seen, the centurion saw Jesus enter into death when and how he wanted to because Jesus was in control, not death. And seeing this display of power and restraint and submission and suffering caused the centurion to declare truly this was the Son of God. He saw and he was filled with terror, which was an ironic statement for him to make Right? In traditional Roman culture, the awarding of the title of God or Son of God was given to emperors and kings, never of a despised person hanging on a cross. And what got you the title of Son of God was your military achievements, your victories, your veneration by the crowds, your control of the masses, all of that, lording it over others. These were the signs that you were God-worthy. Suffering, loss, mockery, crucifixion were signs or evidences that you were not divine, Right? So for the readers of Matthew's gospel, it was a contradiction, an impossibility, a foolery for the Roman to declare that this dead mockery of the king of the Jews was the son of God. And that's why the gospel of Jesus is so divisive at times and why it's so difficult for people to believe it. What kind of a God dies? What kind of a God suffers? What kind of a God allows himself to be mocked and ridiculed, beaten and whipped? What kind of a God allows mockery and suffering and death into the world that he created? If he's a good God, right? But then again, what kind of a God becomes human and enters the world through the birth canal? The answer is the true God. The good God. The true God is the only God who died on a cross for you. And the Saturian's response is the response God desires from all of us. I want you to consider what the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in the city of Rome. It's found in Romans 10. He wrote this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how do we respond to God's, to a God who suffers and dies? Paul's message, Jesus' message, the message of the Bible is simply this. We repent and we believe. We repent. We admit that we need Jesus, the Son of God, to die for us. 
and we receive salvation and eternal life. We believe, we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and we receive justification and forgiveness from our sins and then we confess. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And confessing that Jesus is Lord is just an admission that no other person, no other king, no other deity, no other spirit, no other movement, no other ruler, no other organization, nothing else can save but Jesus. That is what true belief is, a turning away from all other options because they don't work and relying solely on Jesus for salvation. The truth of the matter is you can't tack Jesus onto something else in life. You can't trust in him and something else for salvation. You can't dabble in spiritism and add Jesus to it as a safety precaution in case it doesn't work. You can't pursue financial security and power and fame and add Jesus as a means to our own end. We can't follow the law of the Old Testament and add Jesus to it just to be safe. You can't put our hope in the right politician and tag Jesus on just to make it morally acceptable. It's Jesus' way. He's the only way. And we come together on Good Friday, year after year, not to celebrate the Lord's death, but to proclaim it and to encourage one another to keep on believing it. Because his death is the only means of salvation. And this is the way, the only way that God determined we could receive eternal life and peace and hope. It's found only in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Kings. He is the God who died for you. So repent and believe. Confess along with the centurion that Jesus is the Son of God and you need him. And if you haven't done it today, I would ask you to do so. But the reality that righteous people suffer is nothing new. It was true for the Son of God. It was true for God. It was true for the great men of God. It was the topic which men and women have struggled to understand down through history. People like Job and Solomon and Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Moses and Joseph and King David himself all struggled with this question. Their writings are full of the question that we tend to ask God when we suffer or when someone we love suffers. Why, God? Why? If you ever hit the ground with heart pounding in your chest, grief overwhelming your soul, emotional pain so intense that it radiates into physical pain, and all you can muster is the cry of anguish, God, why? Jesus has been there. He's been there. Jesus suffered beyond what any of us have ever suffered so that he could empathize with us and so he could save us. The Apostle Peter, too, suffered quite a bit, and he wrote the following to believers who were suffering persecution in, in his, his, his book entitled by his name, chapter 4. He says, Beloved, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange was happening to you. He says, But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He continues, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You know, Peter didn't mince words. Suffering to him was an expected thing as a follower of Jesus. But why? Why, why did God design it in such a way that he had to suffer? Why did God make suffering part of this world? Why must we suffer? It seems cruel, inhumane, and unnecessary. Here's my take on why God designed it this way. Paul gives us an answer in, in the letter to the Roman church. And he wrote the following to folks who were being thrown to lions, impaled on poles in Nero's garden, folks being thrown into prison, hiding in the catacombs, folks grieving the loss of family and friends. And here's what his important words are for us in Romans chapter 5. He says, We rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, whether truth or fiction, we all like a good story, don't we? What are the makings of a good story? A good story must have, in my opinion, struggle, mystery, danger, adventure, suffering, vindication, victory, reconciliation, those type of things, right? Nobody wants to hear a safe story. A boring story is boring because there's no struggle to overcome, right? Nobody wants to hear about someone get up in the morning, have coffee, eat breakfast, sit down, read the paper, take the dog out for a walk, and go back to bed. That's not a story, right? Stories that speak to our hearts are stories of struggle, that tell of people dealing with disappointments and difficulties about overcoming trials, right? Those are the exciting ones. I want you to think of the greatest stories that you can think of. Some of, some of the ones that are my favorites are Fox's Book of Martyrs and Pilgrim's Progress, Lord of the Rings, right? Star Wars, Schindler's List, Band of Brothers, right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer's biography. I don't know if you knew new ones out there. The Wingfeather Saga, Missionary Biographies, and of course, the Chronicles of Narnia. My youngest son and I are reading through these right now. But all of them have a theme, endurance through suffering, right? You see, there's something inherently eternal and significant about overcoming struggle and suffering for the sake of others or something bigger than you. Now, I don't know who's read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe out there. Yeah, some of you. Okay, in that book, C.S. Lewis's book, Edmund is one of the siblings who finds himself in a strange yet wonderful world of Narnia. And Edmund quickly meets the White Witch, not a good person, obviously, by her name, who lures him into temptation with Turkish delight. I don't know. I've never really had it. Uh, Here it's really good. She takes Edmund captive, right? And then uh, the only way for him to be free is for there to be an exchange, a life for a life. Aslan, the lion who depicts Jesus, takes Edmund's place by allowing the witch to kill him on a stone table. And Aslan is dead in the middle of that story. Dead. But just when it seems that evil has won, the unexpected happens and Aslan rises up from the dead. Right? Through his resurrection, he not only frees Edmund, but he breaks the witch's curse and all the power over Narnia and everyone is happily ever ever. Now, C.S. Lewis writes this book as an allegory of the story of Jesus. But what's surprising to me is that believers and unbelievers alike like this book. There's even a movie made about it, right? It was, yeah. Why? Why do we like that stuff? It's because of the glory and the vindication and the reconciliation and the forgiveness. All looks bright and beautiful against a backdrop of suffering and struggle and difficulty and sin and death. And that's the way that God designed the world that we live in. For love to truly be loving, it must be chosen over the evil of hate. For glory to truly be glorious, it must be achieved over the greatest of obstacles. For victory to truly be triumphant, it must be acquired through much struggle and suffering against evil. For there to be forgiveness, there has to be a wrong committed. For there to be mercy, there must be a sin which causes one to be undeserving. For there to be courage, there must be something to be afraid of. For there to be hope, there must be a reason for hopelessness. And this is the way that God designed it. And it's beautiful if you step back and you appreciate it. You see, God uses the suffering and the struggle to shape us into people who reflect his character and his nature. People who endure because God is faithful. People who love because God is love. People who are patient because God is long-suffering. People who are compassionate because God is merciful. People who are kind because God is kind. People who do not fear because God is sovereign. People who are humble because God is the servant of all. People who have hope because God is true. Suffering produces hope. And Jesus willingly went to the cross for two reasons on that day. The first reason is this. Jesus suffered and died upon the cross to pay your penalty for your sin. He took the sin of the whole world upon his perfect righteous shoulders and he died the death that we rightfully should have died. He paid the ransom in full and it is finished. And all you must do to escape death and hell is to admit that you are a sinner in need of that salvation and trust that Jesus paid it all and that he took your place. And God promises that you will be saved from that. And he gives you eternal life and he calls you his own. And you get to live in the freedom and the, of the forgiveness 
and with the hope that you will one day see God in paradise and be with him forever. And the second reason that Jesus died upon that cross was this. Jesus suffered and died upon the cross so that we could cling to him for hope in the midst of suffering. You know, oftentimes in life, the suffering can seem to go on forever like it will never end. It can seem like there's no coming back from the place that you're in right now. Perhaps you were fired from your job. Now who's going to hire you, right? Your reputation's ruined, you have no prospects for employment. Perhaps your spouse walked out on you and there were no, now you're there with the kids, the house, responsibilities, absolutely no answers. Perhaps you're watching our nation unravel, succumbing to violence, corruption. You look and it seems that everything else is winning. Evil's winning. No coming back from this. Perhaps you're dealing with an addiction or depression and it's getting the best of you. You've tried to overcome it, to deal with the pain, but it's too difficult. You keep going back to the destructive habit or chemical. You see no way out. Perhaps you unexpectedly lost a family member, a friend, and you don't know what you'd do without that person in your life. Perhaps you have ruined relationships. For whatever reason, they don't want to see you again. And there's a pit in your stomach and a hole in your soul and you have no idea how it can ever get fixed. I want to remind you of the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. Suffering produces hope. Hope that this world is not all that there is. G.K. Chesterton said, It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. If your suffering seems to go on and on, if your situation seems hopeless, it seems like there's no coming back from this, now is the time to rejoice in your sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put to shame, because God's love has been poured into your heart. Suffering like Jesus, with Jesus, for Jesus, produces hope. Now, how does that happen? I don't know. God just does it. It's a miraculous thing that he does. He uses our sufferings in this life to produce endurance, character, and hope in us that the world cannot attain and it cannot explain because it's supernatural. You ask yourself, how do people endure persecution and martyrdom? How do friends go through chronic and debilitating pain? How do we endure emotional pain and agony of broken relationships? How do we continue on after death and loss? It's through faith in the goodness of God, through faith in the vindication of God, through faith in the healing of God, through faith in the resurrection of God, through faith in the promises of God, through faith that this is not all that there is, that God has prepared a place with no more death, no more suffering, no more pain, and because of Jesus, we will be there someday with him. And that's how we can do, as the Apostle Peter suggests, we can rejoice in Christ's sufferings And be glad when his glory is going to be revealed. We endure suffering because we have hope in Jesus. Because God has us in the palm of his hands and he will raise us up just as he raised up Jesus and we will be with him forever.